Good, good evening, everyone. Uh, we're going to get started. Please find your seats. Um, so uh, I'm Fadil Santosa. I'm the director of the Institute for Mathematics and its Applications. Uh, welcome to the IMA Public Lecture. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Professor Nancy Reed from the University of Toronto. Professor Reed simultaneously holds the university professorship and the Canada Research Chair at the University of Toronto. Dr. Reed received her bachelor's degree in mathematics from University of Waterloo, master's from University of British Columbia, and then PhD from Stanford, the master's and PhD in statistics. She's among the most influential statisticians of our age. She's one of, the, one of her most important paper uh, is a 1987 paper with David Cox. I'm going to read the title to you so you'll be impressed. It's called Parameter Orthogonality and Approximate Conditional Inference. <laughs> so, uh, why, why is that important? Well, the work is, has uh, far-reaching uh, consequences from uh, how you interpret data from health sciences to social sciences. In 1992, she became the first woman to receive the Committee of Presidents of Statistical Society's President Award, which is given to statisticians 40 years or younger for outstanding contribution to the profession of statistics. Uh, she served as president of Institute for Mathematical Statistics and then as president of Statistical Society of Canada. In, 19, in 2001, she was elected fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. It's not surprising that in 2003, her alma mater, University of Waterloo, uh, recognized her achievement with a Faculty of Mathematics Alumni Achievement Medal. The citation reads, for her internationally recognized research accomplishments in the field of statistics and for her outstanding contributions to university education and professional societies. Dr. Reed's work uh, not only impacts the field of statistics and the practice of statistics, but as she will show tonight, it impacts on how we draw out reliable information from data and eventually on how we make decisions. So her talk tonight is entitled, Can Chocolate Save Your Life? And please give a warm welcome to Dr. Reed. <laughs> Oh, thank you very much, Fadil. Can you hear me at the back? You have to wave if you... Can you hear me? Good? No? Louder? Okay. Better? Best? Okay. Um, so, actually, my subtitle is Parameter Orthogonality and Approximate Conditional Inference. Uh, <laughs> But uh, Alice Tibbetts persuaded me that this would sound a little more interesting to the audience that they were intending. Uh, I, I threw this title out to her, not as a title, but as a kind of example of a silly headline. Almost too silly. This was actually cut from the Toronto newspaper in August 2005, I think. And you kind of know the answer has to be no, right? I mean, it's not that simple. But, um, but it led me to think about some things related to statistics that I thought I would talk about. And I guess Alice really likes chocolate, so uh, she insisted that, that I use this title. So um, what, I, what I really am going to talk about is aspects of statistics that I teach from the newspaper. There's a smallish group of academics and, and college teachers who, instead of teaching from a textbook, uh, try to teach basically from newspaper articles and uh, headlines and, and try to make the, the, the uh, in topics that we cover just more tuned into what's happening every day. So in, in lectures like this, I often start with uh, three questions or people often ask me three questions when they hear I'm going to give a public lecture. What is statistics and what do statisticians do and, of course, for some of you, why do I have to take that stats course? And this is a cartoon I found on the Internet. Hi, I'm Ralph, and I hate statistics. Uh, this is Statistics Anonymous. We all hate statistics. Uh, so my goal is that my students, when they finish, they don't hate statistics. And if they meet me at a cocktail party in 20 years, they don't say, I had to take a stats course, and I really hated it. They say, I had to take a stats course, and it was really great. <laughs> So that's what I try. What is statistics? Well, it's an information science. Um, it's a guide to randomness and variation. It's a framework for understanding surprises. These are all sorts of things that 
we, the sorts of answers that I give when people ask me what statistics, and you notice what I haven't said here is it's a branch of mathematics. Because I, I think, of course, it uses mathematics a lot, but it uses mathematics in these ways to study information, to guide our understanding of randomness. So what do statisticians do for all that? Well, most importantly today, they work on research teams. They don't work alone. Um, not ex that's not exclusively true. There's, of course, people developing theories of approximate conditional inference that work alone or with one or two other people. But most statisticians work on research teams. And they study different methods for the collection and analysis of data. They study the science of information, if you like. And, of course, they usually teach statistics, and that's the part that I'm going to talk about tonight. So why do I have to take that stats course? This talk is built on a course that I give called uh, Lies, Damned Lies, and Statistics, which is a first-year seminar course uh, where we do go through the newspaper articles. And I've given this course uh, several years running at the University of Toronto. So some of what I'll talk about tonight are, taken, are, are examples taken from things we did in that course. Some are newer ones. Uh, but my emphasis is always, as I said, to use news items and to teach the statistics that help them to read the news items. And my goal is to show them the breadth of statistics so that they do uh, leave the course feeling that statistics is uh, not only interesting but pretty useful in a surprisingly wide variety of areas. Uh, my inspiration for the course was a course called Chance, which was developed at Dartmouth College by Laurie Snell. And at the very same time, uh, there was a, a new magazine that was launched. This was probably early 80s uh, by Maury DeGroote at Carnegie Mellon University. And these, this was the sort of first wave, I guess, or the second half of the first wave of popular statistics. And the Chance uh, course and the Chance magazine have a Chance web page, uh, which collects these news articles and is a tremendous resource for teachers uh, that's pretty widely available. Um, these are some of the journals that I refer to in my course. Uh, my course starts uh, every week with a, a, a collection of headlines this week in the news, and these these are some of the places that I go to look. The Globe and Mail here, that's our local Toronto paper. That's the easiest place for me to look because it's dropped off at our doorstep every morning. So that saves me a bit of time. But uh, I also look at various other places. Okay, so that's a little bit of background for how I came to give this talk. And now what I'm going to do is cover four different selections of headlines that just caught my attention while I was preparing this talk, say, in the last few months. Uh, this one I discussed with Alice, uh, Can Chocolate Save Your Life? Uh, this one I was prompted to look at because a book was just published and reviewed in the local paper called Pink Brain, Blue Brain. And it's a sort of summary on the current state of knowledge about boys and girls and math. Um, this one I, I actually taught not in my first year seminar this year, but in in my advanced graduate course on data mining. Um, so I'll give you some of the background for the Netflix grand prize. And then I'm going to uh, finish with a discussion of graphical displays of information with some emphasis on the recovery program in the US here. So four different um, headlines, I guess, and uh, uh, four different sections of my talk. So let's start with the chocolate. So this particular headline was reacting to a study that was published at that time in 2005. And they, uh, the investigators published their paper in a fairly reputable journal. They only had 20 people, 10 males and 10 females, all with high blood pressure. And what they did was they gave them two weeks where they asked them to eat dark chocolate, a dark chocolate bar every day and then uh, one week where they asked them not to eat any chocolate, and then two weeks where they ate white chocolate bars every day. Okay, And they measured their blood pressure at the end of those five weeks. And their blood pressure went down when they were taking the dark chocolate. 
went down by 11. Systolic blood pressure went down by 11. The units are milligrams of mercury. But an 11-point drop in, in blood pressure is pretty good. You, most of you don't have to worry about this yet, but your parents would be pleased if their blood pressure went down by 11, especially if they got to eat a great big chocolate bar every day to do it. <laughs> yeah. There's a picture from the paper. So here's the dark chocolate people. And you can see that their blood pressure went down. And the, when they were on the white chocolate, it didn't. Okay. Uh, one of the cool things about this experiment is that every patient serves as their own control. So that you're not getting, and you're not, you're not uh, biasing things by saying, oh, but the patients who ate the dark chocolate were healthier than the patients who ate the white chocolate. Because every patient ate first dark and then white, or first white and then dark. So every patient is compared to themselves, if you like. That's one of the nice things that you can do with a small study um, in, in a short period of time. I didn't. Okay. The, the, the lingo for this is uh, randomized controlled crossover studies. They were randomized to either get dark chocolate first or white chocolate, so the order was balanced, and every patient served as his own control. So there's the 100 grams. But wait a minute, 20 people, two weeks, this is not convincing, right? I mean, that's, by any measure, this is a very small study. Why did they even do this study if it's so small? Well, they do have a reason to think that it might work because cocoa has something called flavanols in it. And these are thought to produce, to, to have uh, various uh, health benefits. So there was some motivation for setting up the study in the first place. Um, they wanted to see the large, they wanted to see its impact on people who have slightly high blood pressure. So they, they had a very well-focused group to start with. And then because it was so short, they could control many of the extraneous factors. And, and cocoa does have flavanols, but how else could we study this? How, what, other types of things could we look at? Well, as it happened, just as I was preparing this talk, another paper was published in the Globe and Mail, Toronto paper, March 31st, 2010. An ounce of dark chocolate prevention. So that's, again, that's, I cut that out of the newspaper and scanned it in. And it's the result of a study that says, yup, dark chocolate lowers not only your blood pressure, but your risk of stroke and heart attack. So that was kind of interesting, and it, I, I dug into it a little bit further, and it turned out to be something called the EPIC study, European Prospective Investigation into Cancer. Now, so they didn't look at 20 people, they looked at 20,000, right, all ages. They followed them for 10 years. So now we're sort of getting somewhere, right? They asked about their diet at the beginning of the study, and they measured lots of other factors as well, their age, their gender, whether they drank alcohol, whether they smoked, how active they were, whether they had diabetes, how many fruits and vegetables they ate. This was a big, long, large study, and they collected information over those 10 years on heart attacks and strokes, and they measured their blood pressure. So th that in the lingo is a prospective observational study. What's the difference? Well, there's lots more people, right? But you have much less control. These people did not eat 100 grams of chocolate every day for two weeks. They just ate whatever they felt like eating, eating and they told the investigators what they ate. And it turned out that the lowest chocolate consumers ate one gram per day, approximately, and the highest ate six grams per day, approximately. So the differences are really much, much smaller. Six grams of chocolate might be hard to think about. Here's a chocolate bar I bought at the airport yesterday from the Rocky Mountain Chocolate Factory, and it uh, was three bucks or something. It's 85 grams, so you'd have to split this into 14 pieces, and that would be your six grams. So that's really... You have a lot of self-control if you can only eat that much chocolate, right? And give the 13 pieces to someone else. Um, so it's a small dose, and the groups aren't balanced at all. 
Maybe all the people who ate dark chocolate also went jogging every day. Or maybe they're also eating lots and lots of broccoli. Who knows? So you have much less control on the people, but against that you have many, many more people to look at. And you can follow them over time. So these, all these things that I mentioned are called confounding factors, whether they're also the dark chocolate people are jogging or eating their veg and so on. And, and as I mentioned, the six grams is kind of small. Well, the investigators were quite thorough. They, they, uh, they looked at a lot of confounding factors, like maybe people who eat more dark chocolate just eat more. They tried to control for that using statistics. Um, People, they had to rely on self-reports. So how accurate are these self-reports? If someone asked you how much chocolate did you eat last year, would you really know exactly? <laughs> well, they had to dig into the details of that, and they did. They did pretty good control for checking. Um, then they're following for heart attack and stroke. So how do we know who had a heart attack and who had a stroke? They had very good follow-up. Um, Maybe the people who eat more chocolate already have lower blood pressure to start with. Because again, we can't control any of these things, right? It's a large study, lots of people, but we've lost a lot of control. They, they were able to compensate for that using statistics. So what are the results? Well, it's not quite so dramatic. The decrease in blood pressure was one. That's, it was statistically significant because it was a huge study but nobody gets excited if their blood pressure goes down by one, right? <laughs> 10, okay, maybe. 20, great, but one, this does, doesn't really count. Um, they also looked at risks of heart attack and stroke, and they reported something called a relative risk, which was 0.61. What does that mean? It means that there was a 39% reduction with the high end of the dark chocolate, the six grams plus to the low end, the one gram people. So that's not, well, it's a reduction. One is the nothing going on. So that's a confidence interval. That, that interval from 0.44 to 0.87 is reflecting the range of risk reduction. If the risk was one, there'd be no difference between the groups. So there's a difference. It's better to have chocolate. Uh, this is how they described it in the study. If the people in the group eating the least amount of chocolate, increased their chocolate intake by six grams a day, 85 fewer heart attacks and strokes per 10,000 people could be expected to occur over a period of 10 years. So that's small, right? <laughs> that's, we're 85 fewer heart attacks per 10,000 people over 10 years. So that's another way of describing this relative risk reduction. It's not very big nor is the decrease in blood pressure. Well, is it, does it or doesn't it? Here's yet another paper that turned out to have just been published while I was preparing this talk, doing something called a meta-analysis, where they collect all the studies they can find on chocolate and compare them. So these are only studies that were controlled, like the very first one. And in fact, there's the first one right there. Can you see that? Yeah. So there's the, first, there's the study I talked about initially where it went down by 11. And here's 10 more other studies of the very same type. And this, it, as it happened, this one had the very strongest effect. So they got lucky or they got weird or, but the balance of evidence says that that 11 point drop is too big. The average drop is about four and a half points in these studies. And as I mentioned, that's from this meta-analysis. I, I think most statisticians like to see these studies of studies. That's what meta-analysis means. And there is something quite well known called the Cochrane collaboration, where they collect all these things. So if you want to know if, eating, if you're eating broccoli really does help, don't believe one study. Go to the Cochrane Collection website and you'll get tables like this of all the studies that have looked at these things, because these things are very complicated. There's no simple answer, and there's no one magic answer for any, we, we, we intuitively know that, but the newspapers try to present it as very hard evidence, when in fact, it's all very fuzzy evidence. Um, 
Here's what the people who did the meta-analysis concluded with. The overall results should not be uncritically extrapolated to a potential chronic intake of cocoa products. This is what makes reading these papers hard, right? This is a very complicated way to say, we don't really think that you should go out and eat chocolate every day. Uh, and uh, er nearly every research paper ends with this, more study is clearly needed. <laughs> Each study is a piece of a puzzle, but the puzzle doesn't go together quickly. And we, we, we have an instinct for this, but somehow it gets lost in the shuffle. And the, upside, the up upshot of it is that people think, oh, statistics can be manipulated to tell you anything. But it's not exactly that the statistics is manipulated. It's that people forget that these issues are very complex and a lot of pieces have to go together. Um, just as an aside, why, why was this headline about the dark chocolate, why was it in my newspaper on March 31st? Well, because I was preparing this lecture. No, it was. Uh, Epic, the Epic study drafted a press release. So if you go to their website, you'll see the press release. Why did they put out a press release about, they've published lots and lots of papers. This is a long 10-year study on all kinds of dietary interventions. Why was that one published on March 31st? Because it was Easter. <laughs> and their, their press release actually said, and you probably can't read this, it starts with, those Easter eggs may be good for you. Study shows chocolate reduces blood pressure. So these are the scientists putting out this information as a press release. The, the um, press picks up press releases and publishes them in their newspaper. And the scientists are smart. They know if they want to get attention for their study, it's a good idea to release a study on chocolate just before Easter. So that's another thing to think about. Uh, try Googling chocolate is good for you and look for articles at the end of March. Uh, every single wire service picked up this story. Fox, CBS, CNN, all of them, they all have an entry there. Uh, this was another funny coincidence. Last week's Economist, the first science article says, eating lots of fruit and veg may not help stave off cancer, study shows. Your parents lied. <laughs> uh, this was just last week in, in the Economist magazine. And here's the paper, Fruit and Vegetable Intake and Overall Cancer Risk in the European Perspective Investigation into Cancer and Nutrition. The same study. They've been, they've been studying diet and health for 10 years, and they're starting to publish all the results. And they're obviously very skilled at setting up press releases for different results. So quite often, there's, there's a backstory to the headlines that, that we don't see on the first glance. OK, that's the uh, chocolate. Um, the, my uh, next topic is uh, the pink brain, blue brain. So I chose this topic because I care about it. I have two daughters who grew up with two statistician parents and insisted that no way are they ever going to look at a math or statistics course. So I worry about this sort of thing. But I've also watched the girls go through over my career and kind of tried to keep an eye on what the research is saying. Um, and so, so one of the headlines that really attracted a lot of attention when the president, ex-president of Harvard went public was uh, something like, can girls really do math? We know they can, of course, but they don't always, so why don't they? Well, let's have a look at what some of the research says. Uh, one of the papers I consulted on this suggested a bunch of reasons why they might not, why girls might not do math. Uh, so here's the worst one, la the can't, right? Don't believe it. Um, but maybe they don't think they can, even though they can. Uh, there's something I'll, I'll talk about in more detail called a stereotype threat, which seems to have an impact on girls in math. Maybe there's, these are all maybes. Is there a lack of supportive environment for college students, for college faculty? I haven't found so myself, but it's a possibility. Um, is there some implicit bias that we don't even notice because it's kind of hidden? There's a wonderful website here at Harvard where you can run a little test to see if you have an implicit bias on any number of different subjects. You answer a whole bunch of questions, 
and then they come out and say, you have a hidden bias. I, I did the one for girls and boys in math, and it turned out I had no bias. But I could sort of guess from the questions. Um, maybe there's a workplace bias. I don't know. There's, uh, this, this is from a paper called Why So Few, which was prepared uh, for the uh, Mathematical Association of America. Um, but the, the net result of these possible explanations is something that tends to be called the leaky pipeline. So here's high school. The girls are the green. They're above the boys on their grade point average in science and math. So at, at the high school level, they're certainly competitive. But they don't take AP calculus at nearly the same rates. There's fewer girls taking AP calculus than boys. And they're getting lower grades in AP calculus. So somehow already, by first year, there's been a bit of a change. Um, bachelor's degrees in mathematics and science, 34% women, 56% men. And doctoral degrees, the difference is larger still. I, I did my math wrong, didn't I? That's 64%, 66% men. My bad. College faculty, already more untenured women, a higher proportion of untenured women. Tenured women, it's down again. They're, they're fading. So, of course, people wonder about this and worry about it. Uh, what I'm going to talk about next is some really clever couple of experiments describing something that you may or may not have heard of that the psychologists call a stereotype threat. And there was a, a really neat experiment done at UBC, um, which was the following type of test. So this, this was a psychology experiment, so they recruit first-year psychology students. And they brought them in to write a kind of um, graduate record exam, so a standardized test. And there was a math piece, and then a writing piece, and then another math piece. And the writing piece, they had to read something and answer questions about it. And they were divided, unknown to them. They didn't know the purpose of the experiment. They just thought they were doing practice tests. But one group read something that said there are no gender differences between men and women in math ability. Another group read something about women's bodies in art. Another group read a, an article that said women could do just as well in math as men, but teachers expect that they won't, so that they, they don't do as well all through school because the teachers think they won't. And the fourth group read a, an article that said women aren't as good in math because researchers have developed, discovered uh, some genetic explanation for this. So they had math test, and then they read something that was to get their mind turning. And then they wrote the math test again. So you can see, again, that's a controlled experiment where each person is compared to themselves because they had two scores on the math test, the first one, and then the bias, and then the second one. There were 132 participants. And here's the picture from the paper. So these are the, the first group is the group that read the article that said there's a genetic reason why women aren't as good at math as men. The second group got the, um, were the ones that were told it's because of the way they're taught in school that they don't do as well. The third group was told there's no difference. And the fourth group read that sort of off-the-wall article about women and gender and nothing to do with math or anything, just an article about women. So these two groups, the group that were primed to think of genetics and surprisingly, the group that were primed to think about women, they both didn't do nearly as well on the second test as the groups that had the different effect. That's, that's one example of the stereotype threat, where what you think about something affects how you do. This was their second experiment, um, which shows essentially the same results, uh, but it was set up slightly differently. It wasn't controlled quite the same way. OK. Um, I didn't mention it, but you may have seen graphs like this, and they have these little bars. And so you can see that that bar is bigger than that bar. But to get the paper published, 
you have to argue that the difference is statistically significant. So the way they do that is to use the bell curve. They assume that the scores follow something called a normal distribution. There's a little tiny picture of it up there. And you compute the probability of getting such a big difference between the genetics, say, and the environment group um, if they came from the same normal distribution. So it's a kind of backwards way of thinking. You say, well, if there was no difference between, if, if the reading that thing had no effect at all, then these scores would all have come from the same normal distribution. But one's a lot, one bar is way higher than the other, so we can figure out the probability of that. And if that probability is small, the result is significant. So that's why the paper was published and why it got so much attention. The effect of stereotype threat is statistically significant. Uh, this, this um, I just mentioned, so Larry Summers was the pres president, when he was the president of Harvard, he mused in an ill-considered public address that perhaps the reason there weren't so many women math professors at Harvard is because the men were better at math. That was a mistake, but, <laughs> um, but he was referring to data that looks like this, and it's true, actually, that in, uh, um, when you compare the distribution of scores on on uh, math tests, the, the lower curve tends to be similar to the results for males and the higher curve for females. What does that mean? Well, the lower curve has more at the high end. So the, you think of this as the score, your SAT score, for example. So these people out here, they've got the highest SAT score, and there's, more, there's a higher proportion of men at the top end of the SAT scores. There has been for 30 years. It's narrowing, but it's still higher. What tends to get overlooked is there's a higher proportion of men at the very low end as well. And 99% of us are not at the high and the low end. We're in the middle. So there's no reason to, to, uh, to put too much weight on this. Because that's I, I've exaggerated this curve so you can see the difference. But most of us are in the middle. Um, uh, you see, yes, so here's another, uh, this was really cute. This is a different um, experiment by different authors, also on the stereotype threat, but in first year university in an advanced calculus course. Um, so these students came in to do a practice for the final. And the people that were the experimental condition were told, this math test is designed to measure your ability. And the other people were told, this math test has been tested on large groups of women and men, and both groups perform equally well in this test. So those were the, the two different conditions, if you like, for the two experimental groups. And um, what, what's kind of surprising is that um, under the, say, the stereotype threat condition, that's the first row, the, uh, men and women got about the same score, 3.13 against 3.08. Um, but when they were told that the test shows no gender differences, the women did much better, way better. <laughs> I, <I'd, laughs> go figure. Or, or the men did much worse, or both, I guess. There's a huge gap here between the men and the women. Just being told that it showed there's, your genes aren't going to help you with this one, guys, or <laughs> this test has no, shows no genetic difference, so you, have no, you can't blame it on your genes, ladies. <laughs> It's, this test has been, is gender neutral. So that's a different reaction to the stereotype threat. And again, I think it speaks to the fact that these, these concepts are complicated. It's no, there's no simple answer. There's no one study that's going to show, oh, well, if only my grade four math teacher had been a little bit nicer to me, then I'd be good in math. It's not that simple. It's, it's like chocolate in your heart. It's, they're very complex situations, and statistics can help you to look at the patterns behind them, but they, but it's they still they don't make things easy that are already hard. I mean, they only help you to understand hard things. Um, okay, so that's the um, pink brain and blue brain section. This part is going to get a little more mouthy for some of you who were hoping to see some equations and so on. I wanted to talk a little bit about the Netflix Prize. This is a kind of new wave statistics where statisticians are really intently involved with uh, computer scientists and mathematicians. 
And uh, how many people know about the Netflix grand prize contest? It's not, not everybody good, so um, it's finished. It's too late for you to win. Uh, but if you had one, you would have won a million dollars. Here's the, the winning team are standing there with a check for a million dollars, and there's uh, seven people on the team. And uh, I went to grad school with the guy on the right, I'm proud to say. Um, so what did they do to win their million dollars? Well, Netflix made available a very large database, 18,000 movies, 500,000 users over seven years. So there were 100 million ratings, because if you rent a movie from Netflix, then you get to log into their website and say that was a one-star or a two-star, all the way up to five-star movie. So they have ratings from all these different users on a whole bunch of different movies. Uh, now, on the basis of that, they have a recommender system. Right? They're collecting this data so that they can say to you, oh, you should rent this movie next. And they wanted to improve that recommender system by building a prediction model for ratings. So they designed this competition. They made 100 million ratings available, but they kept out a set of 4 million ratings that they were going to test your answer on to see how well you did. So it's not good enough for you to say, I can predict every number in this big database very, very well, because you have the database to build your model on. They're hanging on to 4 million ratings, and they're checking your model on the new set. And they do this. They compute a measure of prediction error, which is a very simple measure. It's the sum of squared differences. Uh, and their, their program, the Cinematch, gave a prediction error of 0.9525. These units don't mean anything because it's, a, if you think of it, it's the sum of the prediction minus the truth squared sum from 1 to 4 million. So the truth is 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5, and the prediction is some number between 0 and 5. So because you can have fractions. The prediction can have fractions. Um, so the sum of the squared errors for their program was 0.95, and they asked for a 10% reduction, which meant you had to get to 0.8572. And the winners on July 26, 2009, got to 0.8567. Um, this this uh, target contest ran for three years. So it took three years of analyzing this database to meet the 10% goal. Here's a snapshot from their website. This is their leaderboard. So this leaderboard was being updated regularly for the whole three years, and they would show who was winning and losing. And you can see that here's Belcourt's Pragmatic Chaos. They won. There's their root mean squared error, 8567, 10.06% uh, improvement. Um, and so the contest was over, and they got their million dollars. OK. How did those groups do that? What, did they, what strategies did they use to build their prediction model? Well, the first thing they used was the Amazon strategy. People who liked this movie also liked. So, th so they just looked for near neighbors. These are called nearest neighbor models. There's a, a complicated equation to show a predict predicted rating. So this is, this is the rating I'll predict for user U, movie I. And I'm going to take all the ratings for movies that were also rated by that user. And this S is a kind of measure of distance. So let, let me say it this way. We have uh, somebody rated 20 movies. And we construct a similarity between movies I and J somehow. Don't know how. Some distance measure. And then we combine the ratings with the similarity to build in a kind of Amazon strategy. People who like this movie also liked the following movies, so you might want to rent those. So they might rent them and then rate them, and then you could check was, was the prediction good or not. Uh, another thing they used was something called matrix factorization, which is basically characterizing movies by latent factors. Now, we don't have data on these factors, like 
Some movies are very violent. Some movies have uh, Meryl Streep in them. Some movies um, are long. Some movies are short. Some are old. Some are new. We don't have that data, but you might think that there, mu there might be enough information in this ginormous database to get at some of those ideas, even if they're hidden. And some users just are very critical. Some users like all kinds of movies. So these are the sorts of things that we're trying to uh, assess with latent factors. So that was the second way that they did it. With what's, It's called matrix factorization. You have a, set, a whole set of um, factors, a vector of factors for user U. Those are the PUs. And a set of factors for movie I how much violence is in it, whether it got an Oscar, all those different things. Um, there's kind of an, a nice uh, picture in one of the articles that I studied for this. So here's just two latent factors, and then I can plot it. And there's a bunch of movies plotted as for their values. So right in the middle is The Wizard of Oz. It's kind of generic. And then as you come down this way, The Longest Yard, The Fast and the Fur Furious Armageddon, Somehow, there's something similar about those movies and distance from The Wizard of Oz, right? If you come down in this, this direction, these are the movies that I like, Sophie's Choice, Moonstruck, Made in Manhattan. These are kind of like the chick flicks, except I hate the Waltons, but, but you know, they have a certain similarity to them. So they're doing that not with two latent factors, but with 500 latent factors. That was the second part of the math. Uh, the third part that turned out to be really important and make, made a very big difference in the predictions is to use some baseline assessment of the movies and the users. And that, that was brought in by the statistical part of the team working on these factorization models. So these baseline things, the Bs, are a kind of generic. Um, some movies are just more popular than others. And some users are just easier to please than others. And they also allow those to change over time and, to, and allow the latent factors to change over time. So now we have something that looks a bit like a statistical model if you've done any statistics in your courses. It's a bit more mathy than the things I was describing before. And all those things in the, that equation are to be estimated the, mu, the, the BI, the BUs, the Q, whole bunch of Qs and a whole bunch of Ps. For every movie, there's, let's say, 18,000 movies. And for every user, 50,000 users. So that's, that's a lot of parameters, right? And they did something really simple. They just did least squares. Ignore the red for the minute. So there's, you can explain this to your friends when you get home because it's not as hard as it looks. R is the rating. This is the rating that they used, and that's all the stuff in the model for the rating. So we just try to minimize the square distance between what we think it is and what it was. Okay, But there's, I don't know, 18,000 plus 50,000 plus 500 times 50,000. There's a gazillion parameters in this model. So in order to control the fitting, they put in a penalty term where they don't let the parameters get too big. So this here, the sum of the b squareds is adding up the squared value of all these b's, one for every user. So there's, keep forgetting how many users and how many movies, but some tens of thousands of b's. So we don't let them get too big. We make sure that the sum of the squares is controlled to be not very large. This is called regularization. These are very, very standard statistical ideas. Um, it's sometimes called shrinkage that were developed from you know, very theoretical and abstract notions about 40 years ago, but now turning out to be essential for getting these kinds of predictions. OK, what kinds of surprises were, they, were there? Well, they learned that averaging predictions from different methods worked really well. You could have a method that was actually pretty crappy at doing any prediction, but when you average a whole bunch of these together, you do quite well. That has a popular name now. It's called wisdom of the crowds. That somehow you average a whole bunch of not very good predictions together, you get a much better one. 
Uh, so this is a quote from the Belcor team. The, at the end of their first year, their submission was a linear combination of 107 sets. And that gave an 8.43%. So they went from, they're trying to get to 10% improvement, and they got 8.5% in the first year. And then it took two more years to get the next 1.5%. Um, as, they, as the contests went on, different teams would join together. So the teams that were, say, one and two on the, on the leaderboard would become a single team for the next iteration. And in fact, the team that won was a merger of three teams, all kind of small. Big Chaos uh, is uh, two guys in Quebec. Uh, Bellcor was three guys at Bell Labs. And Pragmatic Theory was two or three uh, computer science consultants in Austria, I think. So it's kind of each of those sub -team, small teams were just people like you and me, almost, <laughs> working at home. It's kind of cool. Um, but they eventually joined together. After nearly 33 months, our, our combined team, that's the guys I was just talking about, three plus two plus two, uh, became the first to achieve a 10% improvement. So uh, that triggered a 30-day window in which all the other teams got to see if they could do better, and then the contest ended. Uh, and, and so a new team came up called the Ensemble, and they included members of 23 original teams. So the, the winners were three original teams. This is 23. And uh, so the actual winner was determined by Netflix. And the two top teams were tied. Uh, this is sort of July 26, 2009. There's the leaderboard again that I showed you before. You see that two teams are tied at 8, 5, 6, 7. If you go to more decimal places, um, the second team was actually a little bit better. But the rules were established at the start of the competition three years earlier that it would be rounded to four decimal places. So, so they were tied. So why did that team win the million dollars? It went by how soon you got your entry in. So here's the times here, 29th of July, 1818 and 1838. They lost by 20 minutes after three years. <laughs> That's pretty spectacular. Yeah, that would suck. But it's also kind of a nice uh, victory for the little guy because the ensemble is, uh, as I mentioned, a group of 23 teams, uh, most of whom are companies. So they're mo mostly teams formed by companies that are using this software to develop products that they can sell in the marketplace, whereas the team that won, the seven guys, are all kind of independent, back of the envelope, in their basement types. So it's kind of like a nice victory for the little guy as well. What kind of lessons did they learn? Well, it, it developed a huge amount of research for these recommender systems, which are very important now. Uh, it increased the collaboration among computer scientists, statisticians, and engineers enormously. Um, and something that I hope to study from a theoretical point of view, these ensemble methods are amazing. So ensemble method just means you take a whole bunch of different classifiers or predictors and just average them together in a very simple way. And they're doing much better. And in fact, when you combine the results of the first and second place teams, you get down to 8555, which is actually quite a significant advance over what they were targeting at. And that's just taking the first place team times 50% plus the second place team times 50%. They were tied at 8567, but taking half of one plus half of the other gets you a bonus. Who knows? <laughs> um, none of these things are easy. Netflix was planning to have a second competition, which they've just canceled. And it turns out they've canceled it because they're being sued for privacy issues for the first contest because they released this data on what movies. They didn't release any information on the customer. They released movie names and ratings. So there, there was no detailed information about any of their customers. But a woman in Seattle said that she felt that her privacy could be violated because of the type of movie that she liked to rent and she liked to rate. And so she sued them. And... They settled out of court, but they canceled their second contest. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, weird. This picture doesn't come through so well for you as it does for me, 
but I'll show you a better one in a minute. But if, you, if you're on the internet, you can go to that website and find it. Um, this is from the, the second place team, and it's a picture of all the movies. Um, let's see if the, if the next one is a little better. Yeah, that's a little better. So this is, this is the movie database. Every movie is joined to another movie, and the color of the line between them re registers the strength of the connection between the two movies. So the yellow is strong and red is not so strong, which is a bit weird, but uh, that's how it's done. Here's, here's a close-up, which you might be able to see a little bit of. I can read you some of the movies, for example, that are here. I think I can. Um, 21 grams. Uh, Holy Smoke, The Dreamers, The Cooler. So there's a kind of weird collection of movies. Uh, Lost in Translation is right here, and it's got a very strong link to the Royal Tenenbaums. So, there's a whole uh, Flickr site of all these close-ups, which are kind of fun. This was a graphical picture uh, that, that uh, one of the ensemble members has constructed, so he's got a whole Flickr uh, photo site of this. And, and I put these up uh, for you because it leads me into my very last topic, which sounds like it doesn't have a lot to do with um, Netflix, but it, it's, it's called How Is Your Recovery Money Spent? But it's really my segue into the last topic, which is statistical graphics. This was another just very lucky thing for me. This guy's one of my heroes. His name is Edward Tufte. And he wrote a book in 1983 called The Visual Display of Quantitative Information. And I was so excited when I saw that book because it's the first ever coffee table book for statistics. It's got beautiful pictures in it. And he drew attention to the fact that there are good ways and bad ways to display data. And he made this a kind of field of study for us. Now, as it happens, he's just been appointed in Mar on March 5th. He was appointed to Obama's recovery advisory panel. So he's been asked to be one of the advisors on the recovery money and the allocation of the recovery money, and most importantly, the presentation of the results from the recovery money to the general public. Now, first I'm gonna show you some bad graphs just because they're so much fun. And I had the pleasure today of meeting Milo Shield who found this graph and, and sent it to a publication where I found it, and I've kept it ever since. This is a pie chart. You've all seen pie charts. But every wedge of this pie chart has more than 60%. <laughs> Something's wrong. <laughs> uh, here's something I found once in USA Today. This is uh, high school athletes, states with the most high school athletes. OK, Texas and California. 763,000, a bit fewer, 735,000. New York, well, 350,000. Almost as many as Texas, according to that. Right, something's wrong. Those, once you start collecting these, you can, you can have a ball, because they're all over the place. This is a graph that Tufty made very, very famous, one of the best still graphs that I think we've ever seen. How many people have seen this picture somewhere? This is a map of Russia, and this is Napoleon's advance to Moscow in the War of 1812. And the beige line is the army going to Moscow. Moscow is right up at the top right. And the black line is the retreat. If you've read uh, War and Peace, you know that when they got to Moscow, the city had been emptied and the supplies had been burned, so they had, they had no food. It was winter, and they had to head back to France. And so the width of the line on the retreat is in black, and so you see when they came back to the uh, Berezina River here at the end, that's a visual representation of how many men died in that campaign. And along the bottom is the degrees uh, on the retreat. So you can see the temperature was dropping, and basically people were dying of either cold or starvation. Uh, Tufty made this uh, famous, but really what I wanted to talk about, as I said, was the recovery. So the recovery money was $787 billion. 
which sounds like a lot, but, but how much is that really? I mean, it's pretty hard to get your head around $787 billion. So here it is. This is how much it is. And again, uh, let me go to the next one, which I hope is a little better. So there's the U.S., and every circle is, some, is a grant from the recovery money. Every single circle. Now, if I'm really lucky, I can do this for you live. Yeah, so let me try, and then that'll take us to the end. I want Firefox, and you should be able to see it. Uh, I, I think I'm not going to be that lucky, so let me go back to my still pictures. Okay, so that you, if you're online, go to this website. It's, it's amazing. This really explains $787 billion in a way I've, I've never seen before. So you can drill down, of course. That's the point. So here's Minnesota here. Um, and I've actually mistakenly clicked on a little box there. So let's, there's Minnesota. So there's the recovery money in Minnesota, one dot for every grant. And you can mouse over this, and as soon as you go over it in real time, you find out a little window pops up to tell you what the money is. So I was kind of curious about this little piece of Minnesota that's sticking into Canada. So I went there, and I found the Grand Portage Reservation Tribal Council got $33,000. Okay, that's, that's one of the circles. Um, I looked at, into uh, Minneapolis-St. Paul. I noticed there's an awful lot of construction on my way in from the airport. So <laughs> there's a lot of recovery money there. Uh, so there's, so what, as soon as you come in, so you can see the slider on the side where you can magnify things. As you drill down, you get, instead of a kind of Google Earth, you get a Google map. So here we are in Minneapolis-St. Paul. And you can go to your neighborhood and find out where your recovery money is. It's easy, and it's so interactive, it's just brilliant. So here's the uh, Cedar Riverside Community School, got $117,000. I, I, I've been playing with this for, for hours, I can't stop myself. <laughs> uh, you will find quite a bit, once you zero in on this neighborhood, you'll find that the regents of the University of Minnesota did pretty well in the recovery. <laughs> Uh, package. They've got lots of, that would include, I am assuming, NSF grants and NIH grants and so on. Um, so you can play with that. But there's, there's your answer, how much is $787 billion? And I think we really owe uh, this, this uh, presentation to the god of graphics, such as Edward Tufte. Um, so those are the different topics that, that I cover in my course and in lectures like this. I've got a bunch of references that I'll put on my website. And I'll leave you with, finally, uh, one more um, amazing website that you should try out. And you will see this work, I think, because I very hesitatingly made a PowerPoint movie. This is plotting life expectancy against income over time. So you can see the life expectancy increasing and income increasing as time goes on. And the world is cover colored with different colors up in the right. And you will see in a minute a rather large red blob start to move its way up in income and life expectancy. It's a little stuttery because I, was, I had a bad connection when I was doing it. See the red blob up and up. What country is that? China, exactly. Yeah. So. Yeah, isn't that cool? That's gapminder.org, another amazing graphics website. And I'm going to stop there. That's my take on why statistics is fun. Hello? I'm sure that Professor Reed will entertain one or two questions. Are there any questions from the audience? I can't see the audience. Anymore. Yes, it's hard with so many uh, students. Mark. Uh, why do you think the article on chocolate was published? Sorry, I didn't hear you. Why was it published, the article on, on the uh, dark chocolate and the white chocolate? I mean, why, why, the, why, why would they publish a, a, a study done on 20 people? The, the professional oh. journal. 
Uh, what, so the question was, why did a professional journal publish a study with only 10 people, 10 men and 10 women? Because it was randomized and controlled, because it was carefully conducted, but it's just a tiny bit of the whole story. But I, I guess I don't really know. Just got past peer review. Statistically significant. <laughs> uh, We'll take the opportunity to thank uh, the speaker again. Oh,